What is OOP? Hey everyone, Garth Jolte here. In this micro nugget, we're going to talk about something called object oriented programming, which is really just a design philosophy, a technique that we can use to build our applications that will bring a lot of benefits to our application. The big one being code separation. So rather than like the old days where we just built applications by writing lines and lines of code that were really just small tasks that did stuff and they were all interrelated and they would call each other, what we like to call these days spaghetti code, we bring that clear separation to our code by creating these modular components, which also promotes code reuse. So now we can build it once and then any anybody that needed to use that kind of functionality could tap into our component rather than reinvent the wheel. And that's really just scratching the surface of object-oriented programming. So let's take a look at and get some examples going here of how it can help us. And I'll give you a little bit of the advanced side of object-oriented programming to talk about how it works and how to design your class hierarchies, which are really your data models. All right, so square one here. Let's say that we are that spaghetti programmer. We're, we were tasked with the, the, the project of building an employee application within our company. All right, so we have an employee application. We threw it together. We got this beautiful front end, and underneath, it's just one big spaghetti-coated mess. It's a big bowl of SpaghettiOs. And then, uh, and let's say a couple months down the road, this application works great, works fine. A couple months down the road, the boss says, hey, I need another employee application, but I need it a little bit different. And we're like, all right, okay, well, so we're going to build another nice front end here, an employee application, and half the code we need is in here. So what do we do? We open this project, we copy all that code out of here, and we paste it into this application. Now we've got the same code in multiple places. What happens when a couple of months down the road we find a bug and we need to fix it? That's right, now we need to go and fix it here, we need to go and fix it here, and, and you can see where this is going. Now let's see how object-oriented programming can help alleviate some of the coding issues, the big one being code reuse, or, or the lack thereof in our first example. So what we do with object-oriented programming is we would create something called a class. And think of a class as really just a data model. It's a structure that stores data about whatever you're trying to model. So in our case, let's say that we wanted to create an employee class. Classes contain the three big things here, properties, methods, and events. These three things pretty much encapsulate everything that an object can do. Uh, properties can, are, are the data points, you know, first name, last name, department, salary, hire date, terminate date, uh, is active. I mean, all the data points that you could think about for an employee could be a property. Methods are actions that the employee can perform or things that could be performed on the employee. So really think of them as tasks. And if we were to create an employee class, we could create methods such as promote or pay or terminate or do work, or my favorite, call in sick. Just kidding, hopefully the boss isn't watching this micro nugget. <laughs> All right, the last one we have then is events. And an event is something that could occur, something that uh, happens that we may want to allow anybody that's using our employee class to handle. For instance, we could create an on called in sick event which would allow anybody using this class to define and handle that event. They could write code that said, hey, whenever somebody calls in sick, send a notification out to everybody in the company that they won't be in today. So that's really all a class is. It's just a data structure that contains everything that we would want to track for an employee to that employee could do and that could happen to an employee. So once we define this class, we could allow ourselves to use it in our applications. We could allow other developers to use it. And what they would do then is they would create what's called instances of this class, which would turn them into live objects stored in memory that they could work with. And every object that we create from this class could represent a different employee. So think of our classes as blueprints. And this is just like in the real world when architects and carpenters get together to construct, say, a house. The architects are going to design a blueprint. The carpenters are going to build that physical house based on the blueprint. Same exact concept here. Classes are blueprint. Our objects are the real live versions of that blueprint that we then use within our applications. Now, once again, let's take this to the next level. Now, the, the real beauty of object-oriented programming comes into play when you create multiple classes that all work together, an interrelated class hierarchy. Uh, because take our employee class, for instance. We're not just going to create an employee class. We're going to have employee classes that represent specific employees. Because that do work function that we talked about, well, do work's going to mean something different if you're a factory worker than if you're an HR worker, right? 
but at the same time they are still both employees. So what we can do is at the very top of our hierarchy we can create something called a base class, a base employee class. An employee class that we could use to define all the common things no matter what kind of an employee there. So here's where we can put all of our properties, first name, last name, uh, title, you know, all the things that every single employee would have. And we could still even define that do work method, uh, even though it's going to be implemented differently down in the chain, depending on the kind of worker. But we could still define that it exists. Now, this will be considered an abstract class because see how it's dimmed out? That means that nobody could create a live object of this class because it wouldn't make any sense. So that's why we use it as kind of a placeholder. It's a blueprint for our blueprints. <laughs> Think of it like that. Now let's head down the chain a little bit here and let's say that we wanted to create a class called CFO. And this will be a concrete class, meaning we would allow our application developers to create live objects based on this class because they would want to create a CFO class to work with. So that would be something that would be a concrete class. And we could put stuff inside of this class that's CFO specific. You know, things like pay employee, uh, view salaries, all that CFO related stuff. We could also then create a CEO class that derived from our CFO class because the CEO should be able to get everything or see everything or do everything that a CFO can do. So you can kind of start to see how this hierarchy works. Now on this side, let's say that we wanted to create a worker class. Still pretty generic, still abstract, because we could have some things in here that relate to all workers. Uh, not all workers, or not all employees are workers, however, that do worker stuff, but all workers are employees. So now we could start creating worker-specific concrete classes. We could create things like, you know, an HR worker. We could create a, a factory worker or a warehouse worker, and the list goes on and on. And when we're done constructing our class hierarchy, we can compile this into a code module, something called a .dll. And now we can redistribute that DLL to anybody who wanted to build an application that needed to work with employees within our company. And this would solve our first issue that we talked about here with code reuse, because now we can build multiple applications that all target that DLL and create employee objects all day long, and we have one centralized location where all that code lives. So if we ever need to add more types of employees, not a big deal. We can add them in, redistribute our DLL to anybody that's using our application, and they can tap in and program against that new functionality. So now what we've done is we've introduced meatballs into our spaghetti, what's known as spaghetti and meatball coding, because people can now write spaghetti code against our objects. Our objects are the meatballs. But that's a whole other design philosophy for another day. In this micro nugget, we saw what object-oriented programming is all about. We saw that it's really just a way that we can model real-world objects and turn them into their digital counterparts. And by doing so, we bring code separation and code modularity into our application, which also allows us to promote code reuse across applications. I hope this has been informative for you, and I thank you for viewing.